starts now. We'll just take a look at that from summer heat to golf ball sized hail as a storm blows into eastern Oregon. Parts of the Wallowa area really getting pummeled with power out vehicles and homes damaged and video from a KGW viewer showing some spots looking a little more like winter than summer. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm David Molko. Wow, and I'm Laurel Porter. Chief Meteorologist Matt Zafino is here with us now. Matt, these images are just incredible. It was a brutal storm for Wallowa County and parts of Union County as well in Northeast Oregon. I mean, people were without power for hours. Uh, there were a couple of injuries reported and a lot of damage. This is the cell that did it. You can watch this move on through the LaGrande area and then see the white and the purple there or the white and the blue rather. That's where the precipitation was the most intense. And if I click on this, you'll see that we're getting rainfall rates of two feet an hour. That's a Doppler radar estimate and it's contaminated by the large hail. Hail, especially big hail, is such a good reflector of the radar. The radar thinks there's actually more rain than there really is. So it's an indication of just how big the hail was there. One indication there was heavy rain with this as well. Now, as far as the hail goes, this is a hail track from Union County up into Wallowa County and notice yellow here. That is not quite baseball sized hail, although from some of the imagery we're looking at, I wouldn't be surprised if there was some baseball sized hail out there. We had confirmed reports of hail the size of golf balls, which is one and three quarters of an inch in diameter. Here's that video again from Lacey Baird and you can hear it and you can see how big these things are. Ping pong ball sized hail and golf ball sized hail. I had some reports unconfirmed of baseball sized hail. It takes up to drafts upwards of 80 miles an hour or more to make that happen. So that was the hail there. Here's another picture of it. And when you look at this, this is from Galen Royal over in Legrand. You figure the average palm, uh, you know, the palm of your hand about three inches wide. These hailstones about an inch in diameter too. So again, large hail throughout Northeast Oregon here. Now what causes large hail? You get updrafts in the storm, but again, it's really rare. And to get the hail that big, as I said, just for one inch hail, which is big, you need updrafts of about 50 miles an hour. You start getting into tennis ball, baseball sized hail. The updrafts need to be a lot stronger, and that's an indication to how strong that storm is. Storm reports. I want to point out a couple more things here. First of all, the winds also a problem with this. We had gusts here of about 60 miles an hour around LeGrand, but another report from Milton Freewater north of Pendleton of 90 mile an hour downburst that picked up a mobile home tossed it 30 feet into another mobile home and destroyed it. So a lot of damage in Northeast Oregon tonight. Things are settling down now and we have to turn our attention to the heat wave that comes next week. Guys. Wow, it gets that bad and it's just scary. Mm -hmm. Thank you, it is. Matt. Well, now to Northeast Portland and the harrowing story of an apartment break in while the woman who lived there was sleeping. And what makes this even more brazen? It appears the intruder knew he was being recorded on camera and kept going. Alma McCarty joins us now, and Alma, she's now going public to try to get this guy off the street. Yeah, Laurel, David, Misha Pierce explained her front door was left unlocked. While her son was out with some friends, the suspect apparently saw it as his opportunity, but she didn't know any of this until she woke up and saw the video. Talk about an unwelcome guest. Without the camera, we would have never known what happened. Misha Pierce said this burly man with a beard walked right into her Northeast Portland apartment late at night last weekend. He just peeks in, looks around, and just walks down the hallway and goes into my son's room and shuts the door. Minutes later, the man heads out with a backpack and pillowcase. His virtual reality headset, his Nintendo Switch, like just so frustrating, like stuff that people work hard for. A camera meant to keep an eye on the dog instead watched the thief in action, capturing the moment the intruder realizes he's likely been noticed. He goes like this and comes back in the view of the footage, like covered his face. Yeah, he he put on a mask halfway through. Pierce said she slept through it all and her dog didn't wake her. Timestamps showing the intruder was inside for 20 minutes. Makes me shake thinking about it, but yeah, it's just like, what if? What if her barking would have woke me up and I would have woke up to a man in my hallway? What if, you know, he would have came in my room? Thankfully, he didn't. And Pierce chalks up the whole thing to bad timing. 
Her teenage son left the front door unlocked because he didn't want to wake his mom to get the key. My poor son, you know, he feels so bad because he knows that he should have locked the door and just came and grabbed the key or what have you. But I also don't want to put that blame on him because that's something that people should know better. You don't just open someone's door and go in, whether they're home, whether it's locked, unlocked or what have you. Portland police confirm they're investigating. Pierce giving them these images, but also going public in the hopes someone will turn this guy in. Like all of Portland kind of knows who you are and <laughs> has seen your face. So rather than running all day every day, like turn yourself in, give back the stuff you have if you still have it and use this as a lesson to be a better person. Misha told me once her son realized some of his things were gone, he checked the camera app, saw the clips, and woke her up. She immediately called 911, and thankfully, no one was injured. Laurel? Yes, we're so glad Misha's okay, and let's hope somebody recognizes that guy in the, vo in the photos. Thank you. Well, police in Beaverton have taken down a massive catalytic converter crime ring. Officials say they got the top people involved in trafficking tens of millions of dollars worth of stolen car parts. It is an investigation that has been in the works for more than a year. Authorities say the operation was centered in Washington County, but really worked all over the West Coast. The alleged leader, a 32 year old named Brandon Doyle, was arrested at a lakefront home in Lake Oswego. He's now facing a 72 count indictment. Police say he trafficked over 44,000. That's the number 44,000 stolen catalytic converters in just a year and a half. Their estimated street value over 22 million. They were renting a summer lake house. Um, I think it's important to note that uh, the defendants in this case were living a nice life. Um, and they were doing so because they were stealing catalytic converters from people or receiving stolen catalytic converters from people. Now, so far, 14 people have been charged and Beaverton police showed off some of the evidence today. A thousand catalytic converters, just a little fraction of those stolen and resold for the small but valuable precious metals inside like platinum. Police say across seven locations, they seized hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash, a high end vehicle and jewelry. Well, let's get you caught up on tonight's other headlines. A wildland firefighter has died while fighting the big swamp fire that's near Oak Ridge. The Douglas County Sheriff's Office says Colin Hagen was killed yesterday afternoon when he was hit by a falling tree. An air ambulance responded, but the 27 year old could not be saved. Hagen was from Michigan and was assigned to a hotshot crew based out of Colorado. The county sheriff called it a sad day for public safety and called Hagen a brave young man. Monkeypox cases are up with a new vaccine strategy underway to split vials into five so more people can be protected. The Oregon Health Authority says a total of 95 cases have been reported in the state, 57 of them in Multnomah County. Almost all of the reported cases have been in men, only three are women. The Washington Department of Health says Clark County has three cases with 213 throughout the state of Washington. Oregon has so far received 6,800 vaccines and distributed nearly 2,200 so far. More are on the way, hopefully within the coming weeks. And Multnomah County just received more money toward a new Burnside Bridge. The $5 million federal grant will go toward the design phase. Now, hundreds of millions more are needed for the project with the hope construction could begin as early as 2025. The idea for the new bridge to be able to withstand a major earthquake. It seems as if uh, they made it illegal to be uh, a person in Portland. It is an ongoing cycle for homeless campsites on Portland's inner city streets. And while it seems crews clear high risk locations nearly every day, it's often only a matter of days really before people move back in. Blair Best has the story from one camp in downtown Portland. It's areas here like on Southwest 4th that's an example of this never ending cycle. Homeless tent sites pop up along nearly every corner. People who live and work nearby report them to the city and over time the city clears them. But then they move right back in, leaving everyone involved frustrated that there's no solution to this problem. From one corner to the next. I just don't like to leave without something to lay, lay down. A routine this man has pieces. down to a science. And clothes, I got pants and underwear. People on the streets call him Lobo. It's right here, it's L-O-B-O, -O, so I won't forget. 
He's been homeless for 31 years. I'm getting ready to leave because we're not allowed to be anywhere. He was sitting outside a business on Southwest Washington when city crews told him to move out. It's demoralizing. It um, makes me uh, feel like that I'm lower than uh, the lowest of the, the human class. And this has happened to him more times than he can count. Uh, it seems as if uh, they made it illegal to be uh, a person in Portland. Uh, at this point, it kind of just seems like a routine, you know, so you don't really think too much about it. Across the street, Jackie James sweeps the sidewalk in front of her tent on Southwest 4th and Stark. She moved to this corner yesterday after city crews cleared her from another site. Just, I don't go far, you know, I just, you know, go somewhere where I can sit down and try to think of the next move. The city offers you shelter or a place to go when they clear your camp. Have you ever taken them up on that opportunity? Um... Yeah, I have. I have. Uh, it's been a while since I've done that. Like, she lasted six in months in a shelter. You know, you got to be in and out at a certain time, and that just uh, didn't fit for me at the time. They need to have somewhere to go, you know, or where they can t direct these guys when they clean them out of their camp. Josh Barrett works at the Portland Outdoor Store. He says it's like a revolving door watching camps move in and out of the neighborhood. They just go around the corner and set up right over there. Same situation. So. It's like that business gets a break from it, you know, and then they just move it. So it's like, when is it our turn again? The city tells KGW they know clearing campsites is only a temporary solution. They say their goal is to minimize the impact that urban camping has on the community while firmly maintaining that homelessness is not a crime. They only remove camps that violate the city's health and safety guidelines. They won't remove sites with less than eight tents that are clean and have no conspicuous drug use. It's like a cancer all over town. Charles Reed lives on 3rd and Southwest Pine. He says a camp outside his apartment has been cleared three times since the end of June. It's really dis disheartening because I don't feel that uh, we're getting the response as taxpayers from the, from the county and the city of Portland. There needs to be a better light. The city says they hope to have a solution one day, but as of right now, they don't have the resources to prevent people from returning to the same sites. In Southwest Portland, Blair Best, KGW News.